In November 1998, Victoria Climbier, a happy and intelligent little girl with her whole life ahead of her, was taken from her home in the Ivory Coast by her great aunt, Marie Therese Coelho, with Victoria's family allowing this because Coelho promised Victoria a comfortable life in France and the best education. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Coelho was a sadistic psychopath and narcissist who used children to claim benefits from the state to fund her lifestyle. To her, this was their only purpose. In April 2019, after racking up debts in France, Coelho relocated to the UK with Victoria, who, by this point, was likely already being abused. Quickly, Coelho met and began a relationship with a man called Carl Manning, an equally sick and twisted individual, and she and Victoria quickly moved into his flat in North London. It was here that for the last seven months of her short life, Victoria was subjected to the most inhuman and degrading treatment. She was bound, burned, scalded, starved and beaten by Coelho and Manning, as well as being forced to sleep in a black bin bag filled with her own excrement and urine in this bathtub in the depths of winter without any heating or light. Her life of horror came to an end on the 25th of February 2000 at the age of just 8 years old when her body simply gave up after months of torture and abuse. The pathologist noted 128 injuries on her tiny body and described it as the worst case of child abuse he'd ever seen. There were at least 12 opportunities to save Victoria before her death. She had repeated contact with council workers, social services and doctors, but no one did anything to save her. In court, the so-called professionals in this case were called, quote, blindingly incompetent. The life and death of Victoria Climbier will break your heart, and how badly this defenseless little girl was let down will make your blood boil. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Victoria Ajo Klimbier was born on the 2nd of November 1991 in the city of Abidjan, specifically the suburb of Abobo, in the Ivory Coast, a country in Western Africa. She was the fifth of seven children to her parents Francis Klimbier and Beata Mosi. The family lived in extreme poverty and both parents wanted the best for their daughter. Victoria was described as a happy, caring and intelligent child. By the age of six, she was proficient not only in French, the national language of the Ivory Coast, but also a local language to her region. Victoria loved to sing and dance, and was the entertainer of the family. She would always be trying to make others smile and laugh. However, she grew up in a country where women, at the time, had few prospects to fulfil their potential, with them being considered inferior to men and expected to adhere to specific gender roles. It's a country that has progressed significantly in the last 30 years, but in the 1990s, it was recorded that only around 30% of female adults and children could read and write. Shortly before Victoria's seventh birthday, in November 1998, a woman called Marie Therese Coelho came to visit the family. She was the aunt of Victoria's father, Francis, making her Victoria's great aunt. She'd been living for a number of years in France and was back in the country, apparently for her brother's funeral. She spoke to Victoria's parents and explained to them, as an act of charity, She'd like to take Victoria with her to France, where she could receive a proper education. A barrister of public inquiry into Victoria's death years later gave this rationale why this offer from Coelho was so appealing. Quote, She was the head of the family at the time. She was a French citizen, apparently, from their perception, incredibly wealthy. One of the analogies is, somebody offering you to send your child to Eton and Harrow and then educate them at Oxbridge. It was also reported at this same inquiry the children who grow up in poverty in Africa would quite often be sent to live with relatives overseas to get a better education. The offer seemed too good to turn down and so it was agreed that Victoria would go with her great aunt and have the life she deserved. When Victoria was told the news, she was nervous but quote, happy and excited, looking forward to seeing the sights of France, hoping to visit the Eiffel Tower and the Champs Elysees. She felt confident about fitting in because she spoke French. I want to say here early in the video, there was never any criticism of Victoria's parents during the inquiry. It seemed that they were loving parents who wanted the best for their children. They wanted Victoria to have the best life possible. That's why they made the decision they did. So please, no disparaging comments about them. As you'll see later, they got enough of that from the monster who took their daughter away from them. Anyway, unfortunately, 
Victoria had been given into the care of a pathological liar, psychopathic sadist, and narcissistic con woman, who had specifically targeted her own family with the aim of getting a child to take back to France to make as much money as possible by cheating the benefit system. Victoria was the little girl who fell into her clutches, and when she was no longer of use, she would be tortured, neglected, and eventually murdered just 40 months later in England, a country where she couldn't speak the language and where she was utterly alone. Little is actually known about Marie Therese Coelho, and that is because she has been, throughout her life, a con woman, a manipulator, and a liar. The inquiry into the death of Victoria could not rely on anything she said about her background because of how deceptive she was, and what we do know about her can only be pieced together from official records. When Coelho was even born is a matter of debate. She gave different dates of birth throughout her life, but it appears likely that this monster spawned onto this earth on the 17th of July 1956 in Benoa, a town in southeastern Ivory Coast. At some point, she moved to France, likely in the 1960s or early 1970s. There, she had a relationship with a man which resulted in the birth of one son, and then married a second man, and this union produced two more sons. Kawaya reported later that her husband was killed in a motoring accident, but gave various dates for this, stating that he died in 1994, 1997, 1998. In fact, it appears she divorced him in 1978, and he then died of natural causes in 1995. Similarly, Kawaya cited various job roles throughout her life, including being an airport manager, but it appears that she was a leech on society, whose lifestyle was mainly funded with state benefits, and she would manipulate and lie in order to get as much money as possible. It appears the number of children she claimed to have fluctuated, from three, the real figure, up to six or seven, with the number changing depending on what form she was filling in, and how much money she could get. However, Kawaya would not spend any of this money on anyone but herself. She would use the proceeds of her crimes to buy herself luxury clothes and handbags, helping her sell herself to others as a successful businesswoman, a woman of means. Everything in Kawaya's life was about herself, maintaining her facade. She's an utterly self-absorbed and heartless woman, and I guarantee, whilst not much is known about her background, by the end of this video, you will despise the woman she became, not just because of her crimes, but her utter remorselessness. Sometime prior to Kawaya going back to the Ivory Coast and taking Victoria in 1998, she was in significant financial difficulties. It appears she was living well beyond her means in France, and had racked up debts including rent arrears. She needed another child in order to have another source of revenue, to fund her shopping trips and give herself the standard of living she felt she was entitled to. Coelho gave various addresses as to where she lived in France over the years, and it seems as though, while some of these were inevitably false addresses, it shows how she operated. She moved to an area, racked up rent arrears, and then disappeared, and moved on to the next place. Social services in France were involved with the family, However, I have no further details as to why, but, given what happened to Victoria, it's likely that her children were subjected to horrific abuse and neglect. Their only purpose was to benefit her. She was a mother in name only. In 1998, it appears that Marie Therese Coelho had concocted a plan to increase her income. She would convince an impoverished family in her native Ivory Coast to allow her to take one of their children back to France with her. She would then pretend she was the mother of this child and this would open up more opportunities for her to rent the benefit system. In November 1998, she put her plan into action. Whether she was actually in the country for the funeral of her brother is unclear, but regardless, she used her time there to seek out a child to take back with her. Kawaya approached a family she knew, who had a daughter called Anna, and it appears they agreed for this child, who was around a similar age to Victoria, to be taken back to Europe, but the parents had second thoughts and eventually refused. However, by this point, Coelho had already obtained a false passport, which was in the name Anna Coelho, and bore this child's picture. This document she was going to use to convince authorities that Anna was her daughter. So, she had a passport all prepared, but no child. Why Coelho targeted her own family is unclear. I imagine that she was desperate, and thought through little girls she could potentially take back with her, who were around the same age. I think at that moment, she thought about Victoria, and made an unannounced visit to her family in the hopes that she could convince them to let her take their daughter 
and tragically, she was successful. I have not seen the picture of Anna, but it's reported that she and Victoria did not look very alike and were only matched in age, so Victoria was sometimes forced to wear wigs in order to better resemble the picture. So, from that moment, Victoria Climbier became Anna Coelho, and this is the name she was known by until her death. It annoys me that some of the reporting in this case refers to Victoria as Anna. I don't know about you, but this feels disrespectful in some way, not using her real name, and referring to her by the name that this monster assigned to her. I will avoid using the name Anna as much as I can. So, with a child and a passport now obtained, Victoria Climbier left the Ivory Coast in November 1998 and flew to France. She would never see her parents, her siblings or her home ever again. Shortly after arriving in France, Victoria was enrolled in school, specifically Jean Moulin Primary School in Villepont, a suburb in the northeast of Paris. She was enrolled as Anna Coelho, with her quote-unquote mother being named as Marie-Thérèse Coelho. However, it's clear this had little to do with Victoria's welfare or education. It was to keep the authorities of Coelho's back, as it appears there had been issues with their own children not attending school in the past. However, within weeks of enrolment, Victoria's attendance became almost non-existent, with sick notes being submitted, saying that she was, quote, tired and needed to rest. When she was there, Victoria would fall asleep at her desk. It's not clear if Victoria was being physically abused at this point, but it's likely she was already being neglected, including on a basic level, her supposed mother not taking her to school. However, her tiredness was likely an indicator of her not being fed properly, and or poor sleeping conditions, meaning she didn't have enough energy to get through the day. By the end of December 1998, just a few weeks after joining the school, Kawaya began to receive warnings about Victoria's lack of attendance. This continued, leading to social services involvement in February 1999. It's recorded that a social worker met the pair and reported there was, quote, a difficult mother and child relationship. I have no further information about their contact. It was also noticed that Victoria was suffering from some sort of dermatological condition. By March 1999, the walls were closing in on Cuello. The authorities were pursuing her due to her being overpaid state benefits, which had been handed to her based on her various lies. Also, the school were getting suspicious, not just because of Victoria's poor attendance, but because when she was there, it was clear she was wearing a wig, which was attached to a head that had been shaved bald. It should be noted and this is a recurring theme, that no matter what Victoria was going through, she was a smiley, caring and friendly little girl, and it was with sadness from her classmates and teachers that she said goodbye to them on the 25th of March 1999, due to Coelho withdrawing her from the school. She told them that Victoria needed to go to London to receive, quote, treatment for some undisclosed medical condition. Between March and April 1999, Kawaya made arrangements to flee her troubles in France and begin a fresh campaign of conning the system in another country, and she picked England. Why she picked England is unclear. I imagine she researched the benefit systems of various countries and picked the one she felt was easiest to scam. It may have also been because she knew at least one person in England, a woman called Esther Acker, who lived in London. Esther was a distant relative of Kawaya, and there had been an intermittent contact over the years. So on the 24th of April 1999, Kawaya and Victoria, who was forced to wear a wig to appear like Anna, boarded a flight from Paris to London, with them travelling under Kawaya's French passport, where Anna was recorded as her daughter. As they were travelling as EU citizens between two EU countries, they were not subject to any immigration checks, and so the pair entered the country, and Kawaya quickly set to work, trying to use Victoria to get as much money as possible. On the day they arrived in the UK, the 24th of April 1999, Marie-Thérèse Coelho and Victoria Climbier travelled to a bed and breakfast in Twyford Crescent in Acton in West London. This was booked by Coelho just before the pair left France and I imagine she was livid having to spend money to get housing. She began to immediately look for ways to get anything and everything for free and line her pockets, using Victoria to get her own way. At around 4.30pm, on the 25th of April 1999, so around 24 hours after first coming to London, Kawaya and Victoria turned up unannounced 
on the doorstep of Esther Acker in Hanwell in West London. Esther was, as already stated, a distant relative of Coelho, who she had sporadic contact with over the years. Esther was not expecting the knock on the door, and was surprised when she found Coelho standing there with the small girl she introduced as Anna, her daughter. Coelho was clearly looking for people she could mooch off and rely on to look after Victoria when she was not serving her purpose of getting her to the top of the list for housing and additional benefits she wasn't entitled to. Concerns were noted by Esther immediately. She saw that Victoria was wearing a wig and, when this was removed, she found a bald child who had patches on her head. Also, it was noticed that Victoria was noticeably underweight. Just a break here quickly, this will be relevant moving forward. London is split into different areas known as boroughs, each of which has an administrative body known as a council, who deal with issues as widely ranging as rubbish collection, to housing, and child and adult services. A few different councils will be mentioned during this video. This is because of the fact that Kawaii and Victoria moved around to a few locations. So due to the location of the bed and breakfast they were staying in, on the 26th of April 1999, Kawaii and Victoria presented themselves at Ealing Council, which covered the area they were in. Marie Therese Coelho turned on the waterworks, claiming she and little Anna were struggling to cope with the recent death of her husband, who had left them all alone in the world. She had managed to scrape together enough money to keep a roof over her and her daughter's head, but would soon be out on the streets. Because she had a young child, there was a priority to house her, something Coelho was fully aware of. The pair were then given temporary accommodation in a hostel in Nickel Road, Harlesden, North West London. They moved into this property on the 1st of May 1999, and the council agreed to fund this accommodation whilst Coelho undertook the habitual residency test, which is an assessment to ensure that people who appear in the country don't instantly have access to benefits and instead have to prove that they have an intention to reside in the country on a long-term basis. In the short term, the council issued subsistence payments, essentially money to meet basic needs until Coelho could sort out benefits payments or obtain a job. Throughout the month of May 1999, Coelho would repeatedly attend Eden Council to collect payments intended to help parents living on the breadline feed and clothe their children. She would receive a payment on one day and then, 24 hours later, return and claim that her child was hungry and she needed more money. She also attempted to complain about the quality of her current accommodation and demanded to be given better housing. Of course, this self-entitled monster was complaining ignoring the fact she was being given free accommodation at the taxpayer's expense. No doubt, if she had been put up in a five-star hotel, she would still have been complaining there was no champagne or the estate was medium instead of medium rare. It quickly became apparent where the money was going. Whilst Coelho was always immaculately turned out, it was noticed that Victoria seemed unkept, untidy and unwashed. Between May and July 1999, Coelho would attend the council on 18 occasions on almost every occasion, she'd be dragging Victoria in, using her as a prop to manipulate others into getting what she wanted. Those who saw the pair together say that Coelho showed no affection towards Victoria and was often extremely short-tempered with her. Coelho was described as manipulative and controlling during her interactions with council staff. She would only listen to information she felt benefited her and act aggressively whenever she was challenged on anything, and especially when it was suggested she get a job to pay for herself and her daughter. There were no efforts to enrol Victoria in any school when she came to the UK, and the subsequent inquiry could find no evidence that, for most of her time in London, she had any friends or any real social interaction. She was likely, when not being paraded around in front of council workers, kept locked in the hostel. Victoria could not speak English, so she was likely completely isolated, alone and confused for weeks at a time. When Coelho first started to beat Victoria is unclear. It's likely that this occurred in some form soon after they left the Ivory Coast. However, whilst in the UK, living at the hostel in Nickel Road, residents had heard a child crying and a woman screaming and noises which sounded like a child being hit. On the 14th of June 1999, Esther Acker, the relative of Coelho's, who had seen the pair the day after they arrived in the UK, bumped into Victoria and her quote-unquote mother on the street. Esther was instantly concerned. Victoria was, despite the heat, wearing a long dress with only her face and hands exposed. Esther also noticed a scar on Victoria's right cheek, the result of an assault, likely with a belt or piece of wire. 
Cuello said that Victoria had been injured falling down an escalator. Esther didn't believe her and took it upon herself to check on Victoria. On the 17th of June 1999, she went to the hostel in Nickel Road and was shocked by what she saw. She saw that Victoria was living in squalid and dirty conditions. She had no toys to play with and it was clear that she'd lost weight. Getting closer to Victoria, Esther could see bruising on her body as well as other cuts to her face. She also noticed urine soaked bedding and was told by Cuello that her daughter was having issues with bedwetting. Bedwetting is sometimes a sign of a child being abused but we'll return to that issue later. Esther spoke to other people living at the property and was told about the shouting and crying that had been heard as well as sounds indicating the child was being assaulted. The next day, the 18th of June 1999, Esther made the first of two anonymous phone calls to Brent Council asking to speak to social services. This council was involved because of the location of the hostel being within their jurisdiction. Because of the number of calls to that department, the procedure was that a call handler would take a referral down the phone and then fax it to the relevant team. Esther raised concerns to the woman she spoke to, not only about Victoria's living conditions, but also about her physical appearance and the fact she was not going to school. Esther asked if an urgent visit could be made to the home. This referral was apparently faxed the same day to the relevant team, and then, nothing. It apparently sat in a trace somewhere, with no one doing anything about it. Esther called back again on the 21st of June 1999, demanding to know whether something was being done. She was fobbed off by the call handler she spoke to, who said that the referral had been passed to the team responsible and they would action it. However, the reality was that the referral related to Victoria was not acted upon for three weeks and not entered onto any system until the 6th of July 1999. What should have happened is that when a fax was received related to a child protection issue, it should have been passed immediately to a duty manager to make an initial assessment and come up with a plan of action. At the inquest, it was determined that this was not the case of Brent Social Services. There was no procedure for checking whether anyone had received a fax. They simply lay in a tray, and when someone could be bothered to check, this is when it would be actioned. June 1999 is significant, not only because it represents the first opportunity to save Victoria, but because it's the month that Marie Therese Coelho met a disturbed man called Carl Manning, and this meeting of two evil minds would trigger the events that led to the torture and murder of Victoria Climbier just eight months later. Carl Manning was born on the 31st of October 1972, although the location of his birth doesn't seem to have been reported. In fact, Manning is a bit of an enigma. There's very little information about him. What is known is that he was described by his counsel in court as, quote, a bit of a nerd, a man who apparently led a lonely, boring life, who by the time he met Marie Therese Coelho in 1999, was aged 26, had never had a girlfriend, and was working as a bus driver in London. He would, during his free time, ride around London on buses and take photographs of the vehicles. In the absence of a girlfriend, he would watch pornography in his home, flat 267 Somerset Gardens, Crichton Road, Tottenham and North London, and would regularly pay for the services of prostitutes. He appears to have had no criminal record, which makes what happened next even more inexplicable, but will return to likely traits related to Manning at the end of the video. On the 14th of June 1999, Manning was at work driving a bus when he and Coelho, who got on with Victoria, began a conversation. Manning gave her his phone number and told her to call him, which she did later that day. Coelho invited Manning to come to visit her at the hostel on Nickel Road, which she did a few days later. Within days of first meeting, the pair were in a relationship. Carl Manning was apparently besotted with Coelho, but she likely saw him as a meal ticket he was a man with a job and a flat, someone who could give her what she wanted. He was the answer to her prayers, as she had run out of rope with Eden Council. She had failed the habitual residency test, given that her answers as to why she was in the UK and how long she intended to stay made no sense. She had told the assessor that she had simply come to the UK to learn English, refused to give details of her children in France, and could not explain why she had left them in another country simply to cross the channel to learn a language she could have easily taken classes for in Paris. She had also disclosed that she had no friends or close family in the UK. Based on this, she was told that the council would no longer fund the hostel placement. Coelho essentially had two choices, 
return to France, or get a job and pay for herself. Neither was an option. Coelho could not return to France, as the authorities were after her, and getting a job, actually working for a living, was an alien concept to her, beneath her. She firmly believed she should have money handed to her. Her plan was failing. Victoria was not as useful to her as she thought she would be, and her anger and vitriol towards this poor little girl who had done nothing wrong increased. Quickly, Coelho began turning Manning against Victoria, claiming that she was possessed by evil spirits. Manning later freely admitted to the police, and in court, that he hated Victoria, although known to him as Anna. He kept a diary which shows the level of evil of this man, with him referring to her as, quote, Satan Anna. So this man, and I use this term loosely, had decided this innocent child was apparently the spawn of Satan, simply because of the ramblings of a deranged, psychopathic con woman. The relationship progressed quickly, and on the 6th of July 1999, less than a month after first meeting, Coelho and Victoria moved into the flat of Carl Manning. His simpering entries in his diary show how he'd immediately fallen for her, with him writing in his diary that, quote, it is great to be in the arms of the one you love. On the 14th of July 1999, having now finally bothered to action the information called through by Esther Acker, a social worker from Brent Social Services turned up at the hostel at Nickel Road, eight days after Victoria had moved. Finding that Victoria was no longer there, the social worker simply left. No attempt was made to locate where this child at risk had gone. They were far, far too late. Victoria Climbier was now in flat 267 Somerset Gardens, the place where the true horror in this case would begin. Please be warned that the last months of Victoria Climbier's life are truly disturbing and I'll go into detail about what happened to her, beginning from this section of the video. So please, if this would distress you, then turn off now. Also, it's impossible to talk about her murder without highlighting the repeated failures to protect her, so I'll weave these two threads together during the remainder of the video. Also, it should be noted, there were many professionals from various agencies criticised for their handling of this case. I've mentioned a few primarily, because I think their decisions were particularly indefensible. So whilst it's unclear the level of abuse that Victoria suffered before moving into Carl Manning's flat in July 1999, the horror of what she went through after this point is well documented and is nothing short of heartbreaking. It should be pointed out that as well as Esther Acker, there were two women, lights in all the darkness, who genuinely cared about Victoria, tried to raise the alarm and save her life. There were Priscilla Cameron and her daughter Avril Cameron. Coelho met Priscilla in around May 1999, when she briefly obtained a job at a hospital, although she was quickly dismissed when she failed to turn up. Throughout June and July 1999, Victoria would be dropped off every day at Priscilla's house to be babysat. She'd be left early in the morning, not collected until late at night. This was apparently so Coelho could go to work, but, as I just stated, she didn't show up, so where she went during the day is a mystery, but likely to spend money on herself or manipulate others into giving her more. The Cameron household seems to have been Victoria's only respite. Here, she could be a little girl. She was given toys to play with, and would spend her days watching TV, and she even struck up a friendship with Priscilla's adult son Patrick, and would teach him how to dance. The family began to teach her basic English. When she was with them, she was a smiley, happy little girl. However, when Coelho returned to collect her, Victoria would change entirely. She would be on edge. She was clearly terrified. Priscilla didn't like the way that Coelho spoke to what she believed to be her daughter. She showed her no love, no affection. I would refer to Victoria as a quote, wicked girl. Priscilla was alarmed when she spoke to a woman who knew both Victoria and Coelho and informed her that Victoria was being beaten every night. And this was the case. When the pair moved into Carl Manning's flat, they initially slept on a sofa bed, but Due to Victoria's incontinence issues, signs of the trauma she was suffering, she began to be beaten by both Coelho and Manning. This began with slaps to the face, but Manning soon began to punch Victoria in the face. This was all within days of moving into the property, and this quickly escalated to Victoria being burnt with cigarettes and having boiling hot water poured over her. During the evening of the 13th of July 1999, it's just one week after moving into the property of Carl Manning, Victoria was dropped off at Priscilla's house unexpectedly. Coelho asked Priscilla if she could take the child permanently, 
because Manning did not want her living in the flat anymore. Priscilla was concerned by this and said she couldn't take Victoria, but she could spend the night. Victoria came in wearing a baseball cap, and when this was removed, Priscilla and her daughter Avril saw a burn the size of a 50 pence piece on her forehead. She also had injuries to her jaw, her eyes were bloodshot, and she had a loose piece of skin hanging from her right eyelid. They had no doubt that this little girl was being abused. Their concerns were highlighted when, during the night, Victoria was moaning in pain, and they noticed her face was swollen, and pus was oozing from cuts on her fingers, which appeared to be made with a sharp object. The next day, the 14th of July, Avril Cameron took Victoria to the Accidents and Emergency Department at the Central Middlesex Hospital. Various doctors examined Victoria and were gravely concerned about her condition, with them being certain her injuries were deliberately inflicted. Brent Social Services and the police were called. They were so concerned that Victoria was placed under police protection, with a 72-hour protection order imposed to prevent her from leaving the hospital. If anyone tried to remove her during this time, they would be arrested. So Victoria was safe, surrounded by professionals, and the story should have ended there, but it didn't. The domino effect of utter incompetence meant that Victoria was returned to her abusers. Specifically, when Marie Therese Coelho attended the hospital, she was full of excuses. The injuries to Victoria were, according to her, due to her having scabies, an itchy skin condition caused by tiny mites burrowing into the skin. Because Victoria had this condition, she'd apparently been scratching so hard that she'd injured herself. As to the cuts of Victoria's fingers, oh, she would sometimes play with razor blades. It appears there were no less than 10 medical professionals who had concerns about Victoria's safety, but it was one doctor, Ruby Schwartz, who overrode everyone else. Dr. Schwartz was the consultant paediatrician and named child protection doctor at the hospital, so the head child doctor. Without even talking to Victoria on her own, and after only a short examination, Dr. Schwartz said that the injuries on Victoria were likely due to scabies, and therefore there was no evidence of neglect. Due to this one decision, Brent Social Services downgraded the level of concern in this case. There was one final safeguard, the police. They had the power to continue the protection order if they were concerned and asked the doctor to re-examine the case. What should have occurred was that the designated police officer speak to the child in question. However, the officer assigned to Victoria's case, PC Rachel Dewar, did not do this because she was apparently too busy. Instead, she spoke to a social worker who conveyed the information they received from the hospital and, without even seeing Victoria or speaking to Coelho or Manning, rescinded the protection order. It transpired that the reason why PC Dewar was too busy was because she was attending a child protection seminar, which led to the following comment being made at the subsequent inquiry. Quote, We will need to ask why it was thought more important for her to attend a seminar to learn how to deal with child protection cases than deal with the real child protection case for which she was responsible at the time. Due to this clusterfuck of decision making, Victoria Climbier was handed back to her abusers on the 15th of July 1999. However, she was now in an even worse situation. She had lost the comfort and security of Priscilla and Avril's home. They would never see the child they tried to protect alive again. Victoria was now even more alone than she was before. As soon as she was back at the home, the abuse continued. Victoria was beaten morning, noon and night, with shoes, belt buckles, coat hangers, wooden spoons, hammers and bare hands. She was burned with cigarettes and had boiling water poured over her. Just nine days after being handed back to her abusers, on the 24th of July 1999, Coelho took Victoria to the Accidents and Emergency Department at the North Middlesex Hospital so a different one from where she'd been the first time. She presented with significant burns, as shown by this horrifying picture, which had clearly been caused by boiling water being poured on Victoria's face. A nurse who bathed her saw bruises and abrasions all over the little girl's body, and marks showing that been beaten with a belt buckle, burned, and likely also bitten. The staff saw front and centre the fear that Victoria had for Coelho. On one occasion, when the latter visited the hospital, Victoria was seen to jump out of bed, stand at attention, looking terrified, and she then wet herself, whilst Coelho sat on a chair berating her. 
Victoria Climbier spent two weeks in hospital, and this was the last peace and feeling of any security she would have during her short life. She became a favourite of many of the nurses and the doctors on the ward, who referred to her as a quote, ray of sunshine. She was able to communicate fully with another living person for the first time in months, as one of the nurses spoke French. Victoria liked to dress up, and was even clothes she could wear by the nurses and the doctors. She was also taken to see the babies in the neonatal ward. She was given sweets and treats, and her smiling face would light up the room. She was given a pair of Wellington boots, and was often seen dancing, with a huge smile plastered on her face in the corridors of the hospital. I can only imagine how those nurses and doctors felt after her death and how they wished they could see their beautiful little friend again, dancing in the corridors, being a child who, in those moments, despite the horror she was experiencing, was always polite, smiling, cheerful, and trying to see the good in a world that had utterly failed her. Despite being at a different hospital and having more extensive injuries than before, the same staggering level of incompetence was evident both by doctors and social services. Again, Kuwaiya spun her lies, telling staff that Victoria, again due to scabies, had been itching so much that she had poured boiling water on herself because she believed that this would alleviate the discomfort. One of the most inexplicable decisions in this whole case occurred at this point. Again, there seemed to be universal belief amongst all medical staff that Victoria was being abused. This was also the thought of Dr. Mary Rossiter, who was a consultant, so again an extremely senior doctor, and despite putting in the notes that Victoria was being abused, she wrote, quote, able to discharge, i.e. that she could be released from the hospital. Dr. Rossiter was grilled on this during the subsequent inquiry, and clearly tied herself in knots, trying to shirk responsibility for her decision. She claimed that she didn't mean she wanted Victoria to go home, merely that she was physically fit to leave the hospital. As was pointed out, this was complete bullshit, and it seems she admitted such, to a great degree, by stating that she believed that the police and social services would now take up the case and look into the home situation. So, essentially, Dr. Rossiter knew this little girl was being abused, but decided it was someone else's problem. Victoria was discharged from hospital on August 2nd, 1999, and sent straight back into the arms of her abusers for the second time. The next time she would be in the hospital, would be the time that she died. When Victoria was back home, the abuse escalated even further. It appears that each time she went to hospital, or there was any concern from professionals, she was punished. She was punished for causing Kuwaiya and Manning the inconvenience of having to bother to pretend to care by visiting her in the hospital and answering awkward questions about the injuries they had inflicted on this innocent little girl. Both Kuwaiya and Manning continued the torture of Victoria, Manning himself later admitted that he'd used a bicycle chain to whip Victoria and streaks of her blood were found on his walls and on the end of football boots he'd used to hurt her. Every part of her body was targeted and these torture sessions would last for hours. Due to Victoria being in hospital, a referral was made to social services. This time, because she was living in Tottenham, North London, the duty fell to the social work team of Haringey Borough Council and the case was assigned to a social worker called Lisa Arthur Worry and her incompetence is probably the most staggering of all. Lisa met with Victoria on four occasions between August 1999 and November 1999, just three months before her death. The sum total of these interactions with Victoria lasted 30 minutes and never went further than her saying hello to this traumatised little girl. Lisa was aware that Victoria was still not in school but didn't notify anyone of this. During one of these visits at the end of October 1999, whilst talking about housing, Lisa mentioned the priority for housing was given to children who were considered at risk of serious harm. Three days later, Kuwaiya contacted Lisa and claimed that Carl Manning was sexually abusing Victoria. The sickness of this woman is beyond belief. There is no evidence, thankfully, that this was true. It is clear that she was trying to manipulate the system to get her own way. The next day, she withdrew this allegation, but this should have triggered a huge response. Either you have a little girl who's being sexually abused in her own home, or she was being raised in a household with lunatics who made up these types of stories 
but nothing happened. Lisa Arthur Worry's staggering negligence is shown by how the involvement of social services ended. Between December 1999 and January 2000, she made three visits to flat 267 Somerset Gardens and received no answer. Rather than raising the alarm with the police, she told her supervisor that, without evidence, she believed that Victoria had moved away. For some reason, she was taken as a word, and Haringey Social Services sent a final letter on the 18th of February 2000, stating that if they didn't hear back, they would close the case, which they did on the 25th of February 2000, the day that Victoria Climbier died. The last few months of Victoria Climbier's life were nothing short of horrific. In October 1999, due to her repeated instances of incontinence, she was forced to sleep in the bath, and when she began soiling the bath, she was bound hand and foot inside a black bin bag, which also acted as a toilet, so she spent days, potentially weeks, lying in her own urine and feces. Carl Manning wrote about abusing Victoria in his diary, describing going into the bathroom and, quote, releasing Satan from her bag. On the rare occasion she was fed, food was put on a piece of plastic and Victoria was forced to eat off it, like an animal. Coelho and Manning would also throw food at Victoria, expecting her to catch it in her mouth, like a performing seal. It was likely that, when Lisa Arthur Worry attended in December 1999 and January 2000, Victoria was mere feet away from her, on the other side of the door, tied up in a bag of her own waist and locked in the bathroom, where she would sometimes spend days. The bathroom was unheated, and Victoria spent hours in darkness, shivering, suffering from starvation, and hypothermia. The beatings continued every day. Victoria was beaten in the bath, dragged out of the bath, thrown on the floor, and beaten whilst trying to protect herself by these two monsters, who had her in their absolute control. On her eighth, and last birthday in November 1999 and whilst the rest of the world was ushering in a new millennium the next month Victoria Climbier was totally forgotten likely tied up in the bath in absolute agony and absolutely terrified by the turn of the century she'd been abandoned and let down by everyone social services the police and even senior doctors she was completely on her own this defenceless eight-year-old girl Victoria Climbier continued to suffer unimaginable torture throughout January and February 2000. Conservatively, it's believed that she suffered approximately 120 days of almost constant abuse before her death. That's 2,880 hours. I can't even imagine that level of horror. She became weaker and weaker as her body began to give up due to the repeated physical abuse, the squalid living conditions, malnourishment, being forced to live in her own waste. On the 24th of February 2000, Victoria was dying, and in the last hours of her life. Rather than calling an ambulance, Coel took the unconscious child to her church, the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God. This was a church where Victoria had apparently been dragged to before, in order to exorcise her of evil spirits. Everyone there knew what was going on, but did nothing. Rather than anyone calling an ambulance, the pastor told Coelho to call a taxi to take Victoria to hospital. When the taxi driver showed up, he was horrified by what he saw. The child beaten black and blue unconscious in the back of his cab, with her mother apparently completely indifferent. Instead, he raced to the Tottenham ambulance station, where he knew he could access help quickly. The ambulance crew stationed there took one look at Victoria and were horrified. They knew if she was not rushed to hospital immediately, she would die. Victoria was raised by ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital. During the journey, Coelho was apparently screaming, quote, my baby, my baby, whilst holding Victoria's hand, but the ambulance crew later testified there were no tears and it felt like a performance. Victoria was immediately transferred to the intensive care unit at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington and put on life support. Victoria was malnourished and had deep hypothermia. She was covered in bruises, cuts, and burns, some recent, some months old, her body was shutting down. 
doctors tried everything they could to save her, but at 3.15pm on the 25th of February 2000, eight-year-old Victoria Clembier died. This time, the authorities acted immediately. Hours after Victoria's death, Marie Therese Coelho was arrested. Initially, this was on suspicion of neglect, and she appeared annoyed by the fact the police were daring to arrest her, with her complaining by stating, quote, I've just lost my child. Carl Manning was arrested the next day, the 26th of February 2000. Coelho denied all involvement, and began to make wild statements about everyone else being at fault, that the hospital had killed her daughter, and she was getting the blame. She claimed that Victoria was possessed by the devil. This unhinged woman could not help herself. She was so deranged that she appeared to believe if she threw enough shit at the wall, some of it would stick, and she would walk out a free woman. Carl Manning, on the other hand, was far calmer, and he gave essentially a full confession to the police. His demeanour was unnerving. He showed no emotion related to the death of Victoria. He freely admitted his hatred of her, and recounted his abuse without any sign that he considered his behaviour problematic. A chilling excerpt from his confession was where he stated, quote, You could beat her, and she would not cry at all. She could take the beatings in pain like anything. It was this confession and the post-mortem results of Victoria's body which sealed the pair's fate. This body map shows the location of the injuries to Victoria. As you can see, there's not a single area of her tiny body that was not harmed in some way. In total, the pathologist reported there were approximately 128 separate injuries. This included burns, many of which were caused by cigarettes, bruises, cuts and abrasions. There were also areas of untreated infection and her body was covered in sores, resulting from submersion in her own waist and being bound in a single position for days at a time. There were injuries which resulted in scars, meaning they were months old, and fresh injuries which were inflicted in the days before Victoria's death. She was malnourished and weighed less than half of what she should have done. In her last days, Victoria would have been in so much pain, slipping in and out of consciousness as her organs shut down and her life ebbed away. It was determined that it was hypothermia which had eventually killed Victoria. She had died cold and alone. Carmanning's confession and the results of the post-mortem were enough to charge he and Marie Therese Coelho with the murder of Victoria Colombier, and they were both remanded into custody. Both Carl Manning and Marie Therese Coelho pleaded not guilty to the murder of Victoria Colombier. Manning admitted hitting Victoria over the head with a bike chain and that he'd caused approximately a third of her injuries, and therefore he was willing to plead guilty to manslaughter i.e. that he'd acted in a manner that contributed to her death, but had not intended to cause this outcome. However, his offer was rejected, and the trial for both of them began at the Old Bailey in London on the 20th of November 2000. The prosecution barrister made it very clear that it was not just Manning and Coelho who were responsible for the death of Victoria, but also the incompetence of the child protection teams, who had been tasked with investigating allegations of abuse against her. Their behaviour was described in court as, quote, blindingly incompetent. This was a clear signal that, once these two pieces of shit had been dealt with, others needed to be held accountable for their role in this totally avoidable tragedy. Coelho was defiant in court. She was rude, arrogant, remorseless, and essentially accused others, including the hospital, of killing her daughter, despite it having already been established that Victoria was not her daughter, and simply a child she was presenting as such. However, as with the police interview, it was Cole Manning who sealed the fate of both of them. He gave evidence where he admitted physically assaulting Victoria, and also stated that Coelho had done the same thing. How he thought this was any sort of defence is anyone's guess. On the 12th of January 2001, both of them were found guilty of the murder of Victoria Colombier. Later that same day, they stood before Judge Richard Hawkins for sentence. He stated that the torture that Victoria had endured was, quote, truly unimaginable. She died at both your hands, a lonely, drawn-out death. He then sentenced them. For the murder of Victoria Colombier, Marie-Therese Coelho and Carl Manning were sentenced to life imprisonment. 
I've been unable to find how long their minimum tariff was set for, but both of them, over 22 years later, remain firmly under lock and key. The failings in this case led to a public inquiry which was led by Lord William Lamming, former Chief Inspector of the Social Services Inspectorate. This officially began on the 31st of May 2001 and was in two phases. The first looked at the role of individual people and agencies in Victoria's death. The second looked at the child protection system as a whole. The full inquiry concluded on the 26th of April 2002. 273 witnesses were called to give evidence. The responses of the people who had been tasked to safeguard children were torn apart. This included representatives of Brent Social Services who had failed to act on initial child protection concerns, Dr Ruby Schwartz, the consultant paediatrician at Central Middlesex Hospital who diagnosed Victoria suffered from scabies instead of seeing obvious signs of neglect and abuse, PC Rachel Dewar who decided to allow Victoria to be released from the same hospital back into the hands of her abusers without meeting her or anyone else in this case, Dr Mary Rossiter at the North Middlesex Hospital who wrote a note saying to discharge Victoria despite obvious signs of abuse, and Lisa Arthur Worry, the social worker from Haringey Social Services, whose lack of professional curiosity and bizarre claim that the family moved away led to the case being closed. The inquiry looked wider and identified shocking derelictions of duty by both Brent and Haringey Social Services. With regards to Brent, they were found to have failed to investigate concerns related to the welfare of 109 children in 1999. In 2002, Haringey was found to have failed to assign social workers to 50 vulnerable children. Unfortunately, I think part of the inquiry turned into a bit of a circus due to a strange decision that was made to allow both Marie-Therese Coelho and Carl Manning to give evidence. Specifically, they were asked their opinion on the failings of social services to protect Victoria. Manning gave his testimony from prison and actually apologised for his actions while stating that Victoria's death was not the fault of any agency and that the blame lay with him and Coelho. Coelho appeared in person, sitting only metres away from Victoria's parents, who had travelled from the Ivory Coast to try and understand why their daughter had died. I've absolutely no idea why anyone thought this was a good idea. They were giving an opportunity to a narcissistic psychopath to essentially blame everyone else for her own actions, and this is exactly what she did. At times shouting in French and in broken English, Coelho ranted and raved, she berated Victoria's parents, stating, quote, They did not love their little girl like me. She also described herself as, quote, a pure, innocent person, and claimed that no crime had been committed before rambling on about utter nonsense. This included her claiming that the hospital staff had actually killed Victoria by injecting her with the wrong medication and claiming that photographs of her injuries had been doctored. When told essentially to shut the fuck up and threaten with further prison time, she responded, quote, you're telling me that if I do not answer these questions, you'll add another six months to my prison sentence? How can that possibly affect me? I'm already doing life. I'm a pure, innocent person in prison. No one wants to know the truth. I am not horrible. God is witness about this. That is why I stopped believing in God. Victoria's parents showed a level of calm and stoicism that I would not have been able to muster. Bet, Victoria's mother, stated, quote, it's been extremely difficult. I have no remorse for her or the crime she had committed because of the lies she has been telling. She keeps on repeating that she did not kill my daughter. The question I must ask her is where is my daughter now? If Marie Therese had loved my daughter, she would be in my hands today. The 400 page reporting of the death of Victoria Climbier was published in January 2003. It was a scathing rebuke of individuals and agencies. It recommended over a hundred changes to the child protection system in the UK, essentially a complete overhaul, in order to avoid something like this happening again. It recommended amongst other things, better training, national databases to ensure children didn't fall through the cracks, as well as specific and robust procedures for responding to child protection concerns. So what happened to the people I identified as being accountable for their role in this tragedy? The answer is not a lot. Dr Ruby Schwartz, was charged by the General Medical Council with serious professional misconduct, but this was dropped in 2004. In 2012, it's reported that she was still working as a paediatric doctor and had secured herself a permanent position, 
paying £60,000 a year. Similarly, Dr Mary Rossiter was charged by the GMC with misconduct, but this was dropped and she faced no consequences. PC Rachel Dewar faced misconduct proceedings due to her failings in this case, but was allowed to keep her job in the Metropolitan Police. To be clear, I've highlighted her involvement, but there were five other officers who were also criticised. They too all kept their jobs. Lisa Arthur Worry was fired from her job as a social worker in November 2002 and banned from working in social care ever again. She lodged an appeal, but this was denied. In December 2006, she found herself on the wrong side of the law when she appeared in court for harassment. She was convicted of subjecting a female neighbour of hers to a two-year campaign of abuse. This included verbal abuse, but also her writing threatening letters accusing this woman of being in a paedophile ring. You would have thought that would have been the end of that, right? No. 2010, Lisa appealed again against her ban from working in social care, and this was successful. This was despite her original negligence, the fact she now had a criminal record, and the fact she had not disclosed this during the appeals process. This ruling meant she could apply for social work positions again. It didn't mean she would get them, but at least she could apply. She spoke at the time about resuming her career. I've not found any information about whether this woman ever returns being a social worker. I hope to God not. But considering how fucked up every decision seems to have been in this case, I wouldn't be surprised if she was rehired. So, was anyone who failed Victoria actually disciplined or held to account for this negligence? The answer, it appears, is a resounding no. What about the changes to a mental reform social care? It appears little was learnt, as a few years later, Haringey Social Services would again be in the news due to their role in the murder of Baby P, whose full name was Peter Connolly. Peter was a 17-month-old boy who was abused by his mother Tracy Connolly, her partner Stephen Barker, and Barker's brother Jason Owen over an eight-month period until his death in August 2007. This was despite being visited 60 times by social workers from Haringey Council who apparently did not spot anything. I'm sorry, but I find it so fucked up. The government can find money to give themselves pay rises, but there's apparently no money to properly overhaul and staff services like social and mental health services, which can actually save people's lives. What an absolute joke. The case of Victoria Columbia has haunted me ever since I heard about it many years ago. I can only imagine the horror this little girl went through in her final months. I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing on New Year's Eve 1999 and I find it hard not to imagine whilst I was out having fun she was shivering, cold, alone and tied up in the bath with no one protecting her entering the final months of her life. It makes me feel sick how Victoria was let down by the very people tasked with protecting us all and especially the most vulnerable. Victoria would have just turned 32 years old, a young woman, but she was robbed of her future by these monsters, who I sincerely hope rot in the depths of hell after serving many, many more years in prison. I hope Victoria is dancing somewhere in heaven, in the sunshine, safe, happy and content, waiting to be joined by her parents so they can be reunited again. This little girl should never, ever be forgotten. Rest in peace, dear Victoria. We all need to learn from situations like this and all look out for each other. So I think it's important to highlight signs to look out for, which may indicate child abuse, so we can all look for the signs together. And also I want to talk about what to do with these concerns. Again, as with previous videos, this is not an exhaustive list please feel free to add further things to look out for in the comments. So I've divided this into two sections, what I would call obvious and more subtle signs of abuse. So with more obvious signs, we're talking about things you might notice when observing the child. This can include physical injury, so I'll explain bruises, cuts, etc. But also things like weight loss and tiredness. With regard to physical injury, this could clearly indicate that the child is being physically assaulted, or in some cases, potentially injured in the crossfire where one of their caregivers is assaulting the other. Regardless, this suggests an unsafe environment for a child. With regards to weight loss and tiredness, both can be indicated that the child is likely not being fed well, 
which is a common side of neglect. Other sides of neglect include a child being untidy, wearing dirty or old clothes, and smelling like they haven't washed in some time. With regard to more subtle signs, it's important to observe how a child acts. As I stated in a previous video, signs of sexual abuse are often noticed in children because they begin to display inappropriate and sometimes sexualized behavior towards themselves and on themselves. They may be replicating behavior they've seen or been a victim of. The same can also be true of violence. If a child is being aggressive towards others, this could be them replicating what they themselves have seen or potentially been the victim of. There's a concept known as regressive behavior where people, including children, who are exposed to continuous and extreme stress cope with this by reverting to a time in their lives where they felt more secure and in control and they begin exhibiting this type of behavior. So in the case of children, some who are abused will start displaying behavior that does not match their chronological age. For example, they may start employing baby talk, sucking their thumb, having temper tantrums or becoming incontinent. This doesn't necessarily mean that a child is being abused but it can indicate some level of stress in their lives which they're struggling to cope with. Also, it's important to observe how a child acts around people. If a child is fearful of someone, they will often show this, usually not verbally, but by how they behave. If a child is happy and playful one minute, but when someone they should trust turns up and they suddenly change, becoming withdrawn or shying away, there may be a serious issue in the home. In terms of what to do with your concerns, I'm going to mainly speak about support in the UK for now. The first and best option is to call social services. To be clear, there are good social workers and there are bad social workers. I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but the absolute worst thing you can do is think, oh well, social services are useless. What's the point of calling them? You have to try. If you don't try, nothing happens. I know some social workers who would walk over broken glass to protect the children on their caseload. You need to contact the social services area where the child lives. And in the description, I've included a website which, when you type in a location, it gives you the contact information for the local team. The website primarily relates to addresses in England, but at the bottom, there are tabs for information about Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Also, if you don't feel comfortable speaking to the council directly, or you don't know who to contact, you can call the NSPCC, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. You can call them on 0808 800 5000, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday. However, you can email them anytime on help at nspcc.org.uk. The NSPCC covers the whole of the UK, so England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. If you call, you'll begin by speaking to a trained operator who will ask initial questions. This will then be passed to a safeguarding specialist who may want further information, and then they'll decide what needs to be done, which may include contacting social services themselves. With regards to the US, I have found information about a national advice line called Child Help USA, who you can call 24 hours a day to report concerns about a child. You can contact them on 1800 for a child, so 1800 422 4453, or you can email them on info at childwelfare or one word, dot gov. I've also found a website with state specific contact numbers. I'll put links to everything in the description. I have two pieces of advice be precise and be persistent. So before you call or email, write down your concerns in as much detail as possible so you can include dates, times and specific examples. This will just help identify the specific risks of the child and get assistance faster. With regards to being persistent, do exactly that. Just because you've called once, if you have more concerns or you feel nothing has been done, call again. Keep going. Keep fighting for children who can't do it for themselves. Make yourself a nuisance if you have to. Obviously, don't go nuts and start chaining yourself to things, but seriously, keep going. Keep giving that child a voice. You may be the key to them escaping a nightmare. I don't know about you, but if I could save just one child from the horror that Victoria suffered, my life would have been well spent. But, if you're very, very concerned about a child, anything they're at imminent risk of serious harm or death, do not hesitate. Call 999. This goes for any country. Call the emergency services. It's better to call help and not need it, than need it and not have it. The point I'm trying to make is that we all need to work together, all of us, to protect children. We need to do it for Victoria, for Peter, for Star, for Daniel, for Gabriel, 
for Adriana and for the thousands of innocent children across the world who have lost their lives before they've even begun. In order to understand the crimes of Marie Therese Coelho and Carl Manning, we need to look at them separately, but then look at them together. So, beginning with Coelho, this woman is inhuman. She's the epitome of a narcissist. She's clearly an individual whose whole life revolved around making game for herself, and she was willing to use absolutely anyone in order to do it. I imagine that she was a con artist since she was a child, and was likely a thief from a very young age. Her life was nothing more than a series of lies, to manipulate others around her so that she could get whatever she wanted. We know nothing about her childhood, but, considering the disturbed woman she became, I imagine it was truly horrific. Kueo was clearly a psychopath, someone with no empathy or remorse for her behaviour. No one else matters apart from herself. She's a woman without conscience. The extent of her willingness to use others for her own ends is shown by the fact that she had no compulsion about taking a child with her thousands of miles away in order to cheat the benefit system of whatever country she was in. Initially, she targeted one child, but when this fell through, she decided to approach her own family, knowing that, due to their abject poverty and the fact they wanted a better life for their daughter, she could easily manipulate them into allowing Victoria to go with her to Europe. To Coelho, Victoria was not a little girl with her own emotions, feelings, dreams, a pure heart. She was simply a thing, she was essentially a bank card, a way for Kaweo to fund her lifestyle. Clearly Kaweo, as with other narcissists, thought she was the cleverest person in any room, and that all she had to do was cry and wave Victoria around, and the money would flow, and she'd be given free housing, a cushy life, and could continue to contribute nothing to society. However, things went wrong. There are rules specifically set up in most countries to stop people like her leeching off the state. When she came to the UK, the situation was no different, and quickly, the mere presence of Victoria was not working. Kaweo, a woman who has absolutely no ability to take responsibility for her own life and her actions, inevitably blamed Victoria for the fact that she was not able to scan the system. How dare this little girl be of no use to her? Everything was her fault. So Kaweo was left in a situation where she now had a child she felt nothing for, and rather than them giving her things, she was now expected to actually look after them. How dare society and this child even consider that a possibility? I'm sure that Kueo felt aggrieved by the fact her plan was not working, but I think, going deeper, this felt to her like a narcissistic injury. She believed herself so clever and she was struggling to manipulate and get her own way. This likely left her feeling powerless and very foolish. Victoria was a perfect way to make herself feel better. Abusing this little girl likely made Kaweo feel in complete control, knowing there was nothing that Victoria could do. She had no one in the country and couldn't speak the language. The incompetence of professionals no doubt emboldened Kaweo. She had literally poured boiling water in Victoria's face and no one had done a thing. She had never be felt untouchable. She could do whatever she wanted to this little girl and no one would stop her. No doubt seeing Victoria in pain, dictating when she could and could not eat and treating her like an animal gave Kaweo a sadistic thrill. The evil of this woman cannot be understated, and it's demonstrated not only by the fact that she killed Victoria, but she had the nerve to stand up in front of her parents and claim that she loved this child that she murdered more than them. I'm sure Kawaya was always on the lookout for some idiot that she could manipulate and control, bleed dry, and then lightly move on. To this end, she began a relationship with Carl Manning. I find Manning a really fascinating but horrifying individual all at the same time. In court, his defence made the claim that he'd been beguiled by Kaweo and that she was the sole reason why he became a child killer. I don't believe this for a second. Yes, I think the influence of Kaweo was very significant, but I believe wholeheartedly that Carl Manning was a dangerous man before he even met her. Why do I think this? Well, a number of reasons. Firstly, I find no credibility in the idea that a regular person, if approached by someone who suggested torturing a child, would go, yeah, all right. Clearly there was something already very dark and disturbed in Manning before he even met Kaweo. She simply nurtured and built on this. She did not create it. Similarly, if the argument was true that he became a murderer solely because of her, this would suggest to me when separated from her, he would revert back to normal, so to speak. He would suddenly see the error of his ways and work hard to make some amends for his crimes, become a model prisoner, 
take every course under the sun to show how sorry he was, and likely obtain parole. However, this is not the case at all with Carl Manning. It was reported in August 2023 that he had been denied parole after serving 22 years in prison because he was deemed to still be too dangerous to be released. Part of the reason for this decision was because he'd refused to engage in any offence-focused courses. This suggests that there is something about him himself which the parole board is concerned about, and this has nothing to do with Coelho, who he has not had contact with since he was sent to prison over two decades ago. It needs to be pointed out that Carl Manning was, at every stage of the police investigation and court proceedings, extremely calm, cold, and matter-of-fact. He showed no empathy or remorse for his actions, and spoke about torturing a little girl like one would discuss a shopping trip. Carl Manning, I have little doubt, like Marie Therese Coelho, is a psychopath, a man without conscience or any real ability to feel sorry for his actions. He's refused to engage with various courses in prison because he likely doesn't even really understand what he's done wrong. Whether he had any previous history of violence which was not reported or had these types of fantasies, we will never know. But, given how isolated he was, I think that he was a man who felt inferior, potentially angry at his loss in life. Abusing Victoria likely made him feel, for the first time in his life, powerful and in control. However, I think that abusing Victoria was a way for him to impress Coelho, with him equating love with violence. The more he hurt Victoria, the more likely Coelho would stay with him. Psychopaths are very rare in society, and dangerous psychopaths are even rarer still, so it seems incredible that these two dangerous people met, apparently by chance, in a city of almost 9 million people. But this improbable meeting of two evil minds did occur, and Victoria died as a result. There's some mention in the reports I've read, where both parties seem to state that Victoria was possessed by evil spirits. I'm not going to comment too much on that. I think potentially this was just a way for them to dehumanise Victoria, making her out to be a demon, so they could justify torturing her. Ultimately, regardless of why these two did what they did, they, in my opinion, should never see freedom again. I hope with all my heart they are never released, and die alone and forgotten behind prison walls. Life in this case, I believe should mean life. Please let me know your thoughts about this case in the comments below. You guys know how to support the channel, and I thank you for watching, but I want to ask you to visit the website for the Victoria Climbier Foundation, a non-profit organisation whose mission goal is to campaign against child abuse. It was set up by Victoria's parents so that their daughter was not forgotten, and to try and save even just one family from having to go through the pain they've been through. The foundation offers a number of services, including working with community groups and other agencies to help identify indicators of child abuse. They also support families of children who have died as a result of neglect or abuse get through the court process. Again, as I've said several times before, these types of organisations should have funding thrown at them, but unfortunately they have to rely on people donating their time and money. If you can do either, please do so. The link to this website, along with everything else I've mentioned, will be in the description. Anyway, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.